here in Fredericksburg, Virginia. They're reenacting a battle which was won by the Southern Confederacy because they held the high ground almost exactly on this spot. And on the 150th anniversary of this battle, there's also a move afoot to better understand the role that Jews played on both sides of the divide. One and a half centuries after the American Civil War, there are still disputes about what it was all about, the abolition of slavery, the preservation of the Union, or the right of the southern states to govern their own affairs. Some reenactors here are still sympathetic to the southern cause. Oh, my father said when we was young, my brother and I were both about 10 years old, he gave us a little lesson there. And he said, oh, well, I'm going to give you a lesson. This is the order to keep them. You are Virginian first, you are Southerner second, and then you are an American. And don't never get them out that order. And we have it. Many Jews living in the South had strong sympathies with such sentiments and were willing to fight for separation from Washington's control. The Jews were simply absorbed by Southern culture. They adopted the prejudices and leanings and political feelings of the people around them. And that is, to that's common. You know, North, South, same thing. And there were about 3,000 that fought for the Confederacy. Judah P. Benjamin was the first Jew to serve in a cabinet role in North American history, serving as Attorney General, Secretary of War, and Secretary of State of the Confederate government under Jefferson Davis. You know, he's not in the army, he's not a military man, uh, but he is an extremely talented uh, advisor to Jefferson. Did he Davis. aid the Confederacy cause as a whole? Oh, yes, yes, he did. In what Very ways? much so. Well, it's actually helping them with loans, with money from foreign countries. Yes, acquisitions. His main duty as Secretary of State was seeking international recognition for the Confederacy. He had agents in Europe, even supported Napoleon III's invasion of Mexico, hoping that the new emperor, Maximilian, would recognize the Confederacy and perhaps convince Napoleon III to do so as well. The perception among many of the Civil War reenactors here is that there was very little anti-Semitism among the ranks of ordinary soldiers. There were different religions and they always found time to, uh, to be able to partake in a religion. Uh, Jews, Gentiles, you know. But the, the parallel to that is on that battlefield, it wasn't a Jew, it wasn't a Gentile, it wasn't a, they were brothers in arms, okay? And then when their church services came, you know, the, the Jews would, would do theirs, the Gentiles would do theirs. So, yeah, it was a good conglomerate. But Jews from both sides were concerned about a tendency to be blamed for high prices within the trade in black market goods like cotton. It led to one of the most significant acts of official anti-Semitism in American history, when the Union Army's top general, Ulysses S. Grant, issued General Order No. 11. Grant never clarified why he'd issued the order, but historians have interpreted the circumstances in various ways. 150 years ago this past week, Ulysses S. Grant's father, Jesse, showed up at his son's headquarters in Mississippi with two businessmen who happened to be Jewish, named Mac from Cincinnati. Grant, they were looking to secure permits to trade cotton with the South. Grant flew into a rage, scapegoated Jews, issued order number 11, which expelled Jews from the areas under his control in northern Mississippi, western Tennessee, western Kentucky, and southern Illinois. Because telegraph wires had been cut by the Confederates, the order took a long time to filter through, enabling Jewish leaders to protest to Lincoln before mass expulsions began. The president tactfully ordered Grant to rescind the order. Jewish population in the United States grew significantly in the previous 20 years, 15,000 in 1840, 150,000 in 1860. So this represented the first time that the Jewish community had really organized around an issue. It also showed that the United States was extremely different from the countries from which many Jews had come in Europe. So not only was the Jewish community able to organize, the community was able to get an anti-Semitic order reversed within two weeks of its passage. 
After the war, when General Grant ran for the White House, he made amends with the Jewish community visiting an historic synagogue in Washington, now the home of the Jewish Historical Society of Greater Washington. President Lincoln was popular with Jews in Washington. 125 members of Washington Hebrew Congregation marched down Pennsylvania Avenue during Lincoln's funeral procession, The Jews were among the first to contribute to the very first statue of Lincoln. There were also several fascinating Jewish figures trusted by Lincoln, including a chiropodist, Dr. Issachar Zachary. Lincoln sent him on spying missions to New Orleans and covert diplomatic trips to the Confederate capital, Richmond, aided in his journeys by passes signed by Lincoln. Oh, <laughs> Zachary? Uh, yes, uh, he's a mysterious figure. Uh, there are several researchers now working uh, adamantly on him. And it's questionable whether he is a turncoat, whether he is loyal, uh, just uh, someone who's an entrepreneur looking out for himself. Someone whose loyalty was entirely questionable was prominent Jewish society figure Eugenia Levy Phillips, a southerner who found herself living in Washington, D.C. with her husband, Philip, during the war. He was a former Alabama congressman who adopted the union cause, despite the fact that his wife was known as a fire-eating secessionist in skirts. And she really was a, a fervent, uh, you know, southern uh, lady in, in the sense that her sentiments were totally with the Confederacy. And she was considered a spy, you know, carrying information to them, yes. Yeah. After being arrested and detained in Washington, D.C., her husband helped secure the release. Fleeing to New Orleans, she was then banished to a nearby barrier island when she enraged the notoriously fierce Union General Benjamin Beast Butler for laughing during a Union funeral procession. She was her own person. She had a very strong personality. So, and she, would, uh, you know, she was outspoken to the point where she could not be ignored by the command, by the military uh, establishment. So it was just too, too obvious and they had to act. Embarrassing for her husband, yes. Yeah. But he still managed to get her out of the thing. He did, he did. But some Jews living in the South felt compelled to move north to join the Union cause out of genuine convictions to oppose slavery, like Leopold Carpellis. He was an immigrant from Prague, had lived in Texas for over a decade. In 1861, when Texas was the seventh state to secede, he moved north to Massachusetts and joined the Union Army. He was a flag bearer. He participated in many battles, including Gettysburg in the Wilderness. 1864, he was wounded. He won the, later won the Medal of Honor for his action. Dr. John Sellers and a team of researchers are now updating the records on Jewish involvement in the Civil War. The numbers are much larger than previously estimated, with between 10 and a half to 11,000 Jewish Union soldiers, compared with around 3,000 Jewish Confederates. In numbers and percentages in the volunteering for service, uh, they surpassed any other ethnic group. Uh, so that's significant uh, in that they earned their uh, place in American society. And so that's, that's quite obvious in all of this. And there are companies, interestingly, that are almost all Jewish. And there are regiments that have a, an astounding number of Jews. And often uh, Gentiles will change their name to a Jewish sounding name when they're enlisting in a near all Jewish company, which is quite interesting. Dr. Sellers and his team are updating a list of Jewish soldiers compiled by Simon Wolf, a prominent Jewish activist of the Civil War era. The process is unearthing many more compelling stories that have yet to be brought into the public eye. I find that their dedication to the service, to the cause, both North and South, is, is really admirable, you know, and some of them fight to the death. There are some uh, parents who lose one son, you know, and they, they have three more in the service and they're trying to keep them alive. Dr. Sellers says there are also many cases where Confederate Jewish soldiers pleaded for leniency after the war, saying they'd been forced to fight. So as more work is done to better unearth the truths, the historical truths of Jewish involvement in this civil war, it's clear that they share the same profound experiences as the rest of the population. Daniel Wrenches for JN1 in Fredericksburg, Virginia.